Welcome to DRJLT Economics. A few days ago, I read in the Chinese news media something that I believe to be rather absurd. Um, this is this concerns uh, what is called an influencer economist, which, by the way, I don't know exactly what that means. Whether it is an it is uh, he is an uh, e economist who also happens to be an influencer. Or whether he is an influencer who pretends to be an economist. In either case, um, the idea that he proposed, in my judgment, is ludicrous. This person suggested that the Chinese government should print trillions upon trillions of yuan uh, and uh, uh, give this money to young couples to encourage them to have more ch uh, more children. This, in my opinion, is uh, wrong in, on two levels. It is wrong uh, in terms of the method, which is money printing, and it is wrong in terms of the goal, which is to increase uh, the population in China. So, in my view, these two issues, well, in some scenarios, I'm not saying that in no scenarios money printing is correct policy and I'm not saying that in no scenarios in no country or no region um, the encouragement of the growth of population uh, is bad but in the current situ scenario in the country of China these two issues are this motive and the method are simply, simply wrong, I, and uh, shows, in my in my view, very poor judgment, of very little knowledge of basic economics. Unless, of course, I'm I was thinking, uh, the person went to the Biden Harris School of uh, Economics. In today's podcast, therefore, I want to just talk briefly about these two issues, money printing and population growth, in the context of China today. First, money printing. It is my view that money printing should be a tool that's, uh, used that is used very sparingly. There are two obvious cases where I believe money printing should not be used. One is to prevent a recession and two is to um, to inflate asset bubbles. The first uh, to using money, pr money printing to prevent a recession, I, I guess and it, the, the, the most recent example and the most obvious example is Japan. Japan printed money for three decades in order to prevent a reckoning because uh, the debt that uh, a lot of Japanese firms uh, just uh, uh, accumulated, uh, accumulated in the 1980s during a period of loose monetary policy um, basically made it very uh, made these com these companies uh, how to say um, that if the money if money if the cost of capital becomes reasonable suitable or even high these companies a lot of them will uh, will go bankrupt so in order to avoid this reckoning what they did was to print money. And uh, of course, the problem with this is that in doing so, they prevented a reallocation of capital. They, um, they basically put these companies on life support and uh, just allowed them to occupy the marketplace to uh, use the available capital and made it very difficult for new companies 
to, uh, to, to come onto the scene, where at the same time make these old companies increasingly less competitive on the international stage. Uh, as we can see today, even though the Japanese economy is still one of the strongest, uh, largest uh, in the world, the, the areas of technology where these Japanese companies uh, are still leading are the areas that they developed expertise in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. They, are, they have fallen behind. And I think um, it would not be, it is simply a matter of time if this goes, uh, keeps on going that Japan will become a backward country to get alongside a decades-long stagnation. So what they should have done, in my judgment, was not to have printed money, but instead they should have had a, a real interest rate that caused, that caused these companies to go bankrupt. And from basically from the uh, ashes with the technological leadership and uh, uh, with, the, uh, with, with the diligence of the Japanese people and with a more, uh, with a healthier uh, financial environment, I, I'm certain that they could have um, come out of that recession very quickly and their economy would be much better, much stronger today than it is now. Now, the second situation about printing money to inflate asset bubbles, the prime example, of course, is the United States with the famous quantitative easing. This obviously is, I, I think I don't, need, I don't need to discuss this in too much depth, uh, too long, because I have talked about this issue on this podcast for a number of times, and I intend to do a more focused uh, discussion on this, uh, on this topic in the coming days. Suffice to say that with just... Uh, a, an accelerating uh, increase in the monetary supply, the uh, financial markets, and in fact, uh, even in uh, a lot of the um, consumer products in the, in the United States, are experiencing a tremendous growth in prices. But of course, as I have repeated uh, multiple times on this podcast, and as I believe Warren Buffett says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. All by money printing you have achieved is to increase the price, but not to increase the value. And with some accounting tricks, the United States managed to have a seemingly growing and healthy and vibrant economy, even though this, in my belief, the um, status of American economy is much weaker than it was over a decade ago, and which was much weaker than it was in the 1990s, which again was weaker than it was in the 1980s, and perhaps 1970s, which uh, around that era were, it was when um, American uh, economy really reached the peak. So these are the uh, uh, times when it, uh, you, it is absolutely ludicrous to print money. But what could be a, a time when money printing may be justified? I think the only time when, when money printing may be justified is to jumpstart an economy from uh, at the end of a recession. At the real end of a recession, not the beginning or before the recession hits. Because in uh, the point of a recession is to close up the previous uh, economic cycle, credit cycle, to let 
to, to let bad debts just um, be, uh, uh, how to say, be either written off or uh, restructured, right? Let the leverage in the financial markets come down and uh, perhaps also to, uh, to give some, uh, how to say, uh, punishment to uh, the greed, which, ne which almost necessarily comes with, with a bull market. So that when everything is readjusted and reprimed, with a little bit of encouragement in lending, a country's economy can restart and growth can resume. This is when it may be a good idea to print a little money. But I must say that even in this particular situation, we must weigh the benefits of that money printing and the uh, increased lending brings against the cost of capital misallocation. Because when you print money, the cost of capital is going to be different than it is in a free market. This, uh, this will lead to some projects which do not and should not, uh, should not uh, receive capital, receive capital. And in the end, that will mean that in the midterm, to long term of course, you will have lower growth because you have lower return on the capital. You will have more, uh, a, a, a less performing debt base and uh, the next reckoning can come sooner than it should be. So uh, money printing has always a cost. It, is, it must only be used very, very judiciously. The suggestion that money printing should be used, money should be printed to give it to people, to the public, to encourage a certain behavior, in my judgment, they should never be done. It should never be done, whatever the behavior. But then let's jump to the behavior that is intended by this ludicrous suggestion by this influencer economist, which is to grow the population in China. You see, I can understand, right, if we're talking about a country like the Ukraine, which is a rather large country with a very fertile land, quite a, quite a lot of resources, but a shrinking population and had been shrinking for two decades. Maybe uh, they could encourage people to have more children, right? We could, we could see Canada or Russia or even Australia to have similar policies. But I think it is just simply ludicrous. Just look at the, 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 the population that is in China. To look at the, the crowded cities, the buses, the metros, and the housing situation, the burden that overpopulation presses, uh, places on the environment, if we want to look after uh, the interest of our children, of our children's children, we must leave them with an environment that can sustain the civilization. Right? This is a duty, not just to the Chinese nation, but also to the world. The world needs to have a level of population that's the, the, the resources of this planet, our only home, currently at least, can sustain. Now, I agree that there are some structural issues in, in, in uh, aging problems in the Chinese population, especially in the workforce. But th these are temporary issues. These are issues that should be addressed by AI and automation, right? And they should not, it should not be addressed by money printing, first, first, uh, first of all. And even if currently young couple would have, every young couple have three, four children, they will still not help 
with the structural issue that China will face in the next one or two decades. And in fact, this, these are exactly the cu couple of decades where the issue is uh, going to exist. After which, the, those aging population that we have been talking about will have naturally just, uh, you know, uh, decrease uh, in, in, proportion, in proportional terms. And the structural problem will dissipate, will mitigate naturally. So even if uh, young couples have a lot of children, it's not going to help the Chinese economy in any way. In other, actually, quite the opposite. The Chinese economy will be worse. You know why? Because those people in the workforce will have to look after not only their parents, but also their children. Not just one, not just two, but a bunch of them. That is going to be exceptionally bad for the Chinese economy. It brings no benefits in the short term, no benefits absolutely in the mid to long term. It's going to be disastrous, in fact, in the long term. There could be, some people may argue, that in the mid term, not in the short term for sure, but in the mid medium term, it is possible that uh, this can help with ho housing bubble. But that's, I think, is a ridiculous idea too, because the quality of the apartment buildings that China has managed to construct in the last two decades are not very high. In two decades, you would expect that, okay, I guess three decades, you don't expect really 20 year old people to, to start buying homes, right? In three decades, when those people are at the age when they are ready to purchase homes, do you really think that these old apartment buildings that have constituted the, 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 the housing bubble today in China will still be marketable? A lot of them may have already been torn down. And uh, it is also true that in my belief, I actually, I think in my judgment, it's, it's got to happen that in the, last, in the next few years, the housing bubble in China would certainly burst. Uh, the, the idea that in 30 years, uh, so, so to have some uh, growth in population that would help rescue the bubble, in 30 years is ridiculous. I don't think the bubble will last another 30 years. So overall, it brings no medium-term benefits either. And of course, no long-term benefit. So after all, what, why, does this, why did this guy make this ridiculous suggestion? I don't know. Uh, it's very difficult to, to guess a person's motive, but I know that to follow through with this, with this person's suggestion is going to be disastrous for the Chinese economy. It's going to be disastrous for the planet. And I think it's also disastrous for, um, for the Chinese civilization and perhaps at large for the human civilization because with an ever-growing population, China now has this single opportunity to bring its population down to a sustainable level. Right. Um, if China's population, uh, tre the trend of Chinese population uh, get, gets reversed and starts growing again, it will be very difficult for it to come down. And uh, that means that we may miss this once in a century or maybe a millennium opportunity to naturally control the population. And then what? When there is overpopulation problem globally, the, 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 the amount of resources available on this planet will now change. Actually, it will, it will diminish. It will be exhausted. What will happen is that wars will happen and nature will take over. That means wars to, to, to fight for valuable resources, food, energy, water, 
air. These are the issues that could be defining uh, the next few centuries. If we don't get population, uh, our population under control. It is, of course, not just a Chinese problem, it's a global problem. But we need to have this population under control, the growth of population, to, to bring it down to a level that, that can enable sustainable development. All right, so I think that's what I want to say on this issue. I hope that uh, you have, there are, I've touched on some points that you find interesting. And of course, if you like this, uh, this podcast, give it a thumb up, thumbs up and uh, share it, subscribe to this channel as you wish. Have a great day.